I'm going to caption it in my own way, but I want us to read Jeremiah chapter 9. Instead of reading from our normal New King James, let's read from the New Living Translation. We're going to read the first nine verses. Again, I would have loved to read the whole verse, the whole chapter. This is what he says. If only my head were a pool of water and my eyes are fountains of tears, I would weep, how? Day and night for all my people who have been what? Slaughtered. Oh, that I could go away and forget my people and live in a traveler's shack in a desert somewhere. All these people, my God's people, have become adulterers, a pack of treacherous liars. Next verse. My people, now notice, who is he talking about here? He's not talking about Babylonians. He's not talking about Assyrians. He's not talking about Philistines. He's talking about his people. God's people are the object and the subject of his weeping and lament. My people bend their tongues like what? Bows to shoot what again? Lies. They refuse to stand up for the truth. They only go from bad to worse. Underline this. This is the key and the centerpiece of my message. The next statement in this verse. They do not know me. Say that everybody. Now, my question is, this is a little bit, you know, the verse started with my people, God's people. Now, I know it's Jeremiah talking, so he said my people, but basically he's addressing God's people. So while they are being called God's people, seen as God's people, addressed as God's people, claimed to be God's people, God, from his perspective, he is saying, they do not know me. So, I want you to see the, the disconnect that exists. While we are here worshiping and thanking and dancing and doing giving and all the things, God from heaven is looking down and says, I don't know you. I don't know what you are doing, but you are not my people. Hence the cry and the weeping. Hence the man is saying, look, is there any place I can just get away from God's people where I will cry morning, night, day, morning? That's all I want to do. Okay, let's just read down to verse, verse 9. Read with me, go. Beware of your neighbor. Again. One more thing again, time. Why? Don't even trust your brother. Your brother takes advantage. Take, I want you to write down first line. Takes advantage. Slander. That's the third one now. Okay. The next verse. How many of them? They all will do what? Fool and defraud each other. Are you writing the list now? Defraud. Fraud starts. No one tells the truth. With practiced tongues. When telling lies now, you don't try to, uh, how do I tell her so that she can believe me? Mm -mm. When we just open our mouth, it just flows. You, you know what I'm talking about right now? Christians have come to this very point where it is no, it, you know, those days when we were, many years ago when we were as Christians like this, one for one reason or another, you, first, you see yourself, I have said it before, so I'm going to say it again, without any hesitancy, we all make mistakes. There's not one angel here in our midst. 
We've all sinned. But there were times when, when that kind of something happens, you sort of, you know, you cringe and said, Lord God, when there was a time when a Christian would tell a lie and you would not be able to sleep. Anybody belong to that generation before? But today, it's like, ah, I've not lied since morning. What's wrong with me? <laughs> with practiced tongues, they lie. They tell lies. They wear themselves out. <laughs> they wear themselves out with all their sin. Nesba. They pile lie upon lie and utterly refuse to what? Give me this verse alone in New King James before we go back because it's a repetition of verse 3. Your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Another translation will say defraud. Through deceit they what? Now remember in verse 3 he said they do not know me. And here he's saying through deceit they refuse to know me. Now, okay, before we read this place, keep the verse here, but let me come to you here, listening to me. What things have, you, have I told you to read, write down and you've written down? Number one, lying. lying. And how many times will lying, lying be mentioned again and again and again here? Several times. In other words, God's main thing and what was making the prophet cry is this habitual nature of God's people now used to lying. They don't think about lying. Lying is now their is their lifestyle. I mean, you look at, now, don't laugh. It is, it, it, this is very, very sad. I know you, you, you can smile, but at the same time, it is a sad thing. I want you to, I want you to capture, I want you to put yourself in the place of the, past, of, of, the, of the prophet. For him, this was not a laughing matter at all. When the nature of a person has become deceptive, you don't know what to believe about a brother who is shaking your hand. When a sister make a promise to you, and a sister and a sister is talking, and they make an agreement to meet at a particular place to do a thing, you can no more be sure of what is going to happen. But my, this brother promised me is not anymore an anchor to, to depend upon anymore. A brother and a brother is having a business agreement and set out to do something. Because you met in the church and you have known this person all your life in the church, it's no more guarantee that what you agreed to do is going to come to pass. A sister and a brother is engaged to be married. They know they should not be coming together for anything before marriage. But those, that, those things doesn't make any sense anymore. Everybody else is doing it. That, they are, that is their blanket for lying and deceit. Because they think now God is like, you know, Apple and Android. He has been upgraded. God has, has changed in spite of what he said in Hebrew 13, uh, when he said, I am, same yesterday, today, and forever. I never change. Now, listen to the God talk about his plan, who never changes. What he was then is the same God today. So God now steps in and he says, see, I will melt them down in a crucible. And test them like what? Metal. What else can I do with my people? What else? Next verse. For their tongues shoot what again? Lies poisoned. Like poisoned arrows. Now, this is what they speak friendly words to their neighbors while scheming in their heart to do what? <laughs> now, kill them may not be literally killing them, but every time you plan to take advantage, to cheat, to defraud, you're actually in the act from God's perspectives, you are killing somebody. 
Every time you lie, every time you cheat, every time you defraud, knowingly trying to get ahead of somebody, to better somebody, to defraud, to cheat, to do this thing, it, it breaks God. And as far as God is concerned, you are killing another of my children. Now, we're almost there, verse 9. And God said, should I not punish them for this? Says who? Should I not avenge myself against such a nation? Two questions. And let's just keep this before us for some time. Now, God is asking a question. Should I not? Should I not? All the two questions start with that one. Now, if you were to, because he's asking the question, he doesn't really need us to answer him, but if we were to answer him, what would be your, what would be your answer? To should I not? And you say, Now, one more thing before I go to say certain things. One thing you should know about God is this. He never says anything he doesn't mean. And he never means anything I will not say it. Another thing, another word. This is what he said in Isaiah 55. We're not going there. He says, so shall my word be. B that goes out of my mouth. But once I speak it out, it must achieve its aim. Now, if these scriptures are true, you can now see the state of the prophet who is saying, is there any place I can get out to and weep and cry? If you go down in this chapter, you will now say, where are my ladies? He said, gather your daughters. If there is any hope of changing my mind, you will have to cry to me. And because you know our men, a man knows he is hurting. You tell him, don't do it, or God is sad with you, he will look at you and say, Muru, and so, yes, I don't hear you. That's who a man is. But so God is saying, ladies, you are the only hope of changing my mind. Get your daughters, where are the wailing women? Teach your daughters how to cry to me. You've got to do something to change my mind or else I'm going to scatter you across every part of this globe. And when you have gone to your strange different countries that you do not know, I will call, tell them to persecute you from place to place. And then my sword, my sword will follow you wherever you are to crush you. He said, I will scatter you until there will be no one left out. Your husbands, your men, your children, your women, their corpses will be manure on the road, on the, on the, on the, on the mountains. And then my sword will follow you wherever you are. To curse. Now, again, why is God so angry? What are the sins and what are the wrongs that they have done that God is such in a state saying these kind of things? If it's, in, if it's in Nigeria, when somebody wishes you this bad, how do we reply? Ah, uh, uh, I beg. Did I kill anybody? Uh, is, is that one of the ways we say? Yeah, true. Did they kill anybody? Was among the things I told you to write, was killing something, body included in that very place? No. So why is God this mad? Because see, you and me classify sin. Small ones, middle ones. And big ones. For see, and this is why God is saying the problem we have here is not as much as the sins they commit. They commit those sins for this reason. They do not know. They don't know me. Now, did you notice that in the Old Testament, whenever you read, God is with Israel, and he's telling Israel to kill the Philistines, and the Jebusites, and the Amalekites, and the mosquito bites, and the, um, the bites, and the, some of you know what I'm talking about. 
And so God is now portrayed as a vindictive bias killer in favor of his people Israel and every other person are going to be killed. They are all bad people on this thing. That is not. Now remember, the heart of the matter is knowing God. God is accusing not unbelievers, not the Philistines and the Jebusites. He said, my people lie, defraud, cheat, do all of these things. Why? They don't know me. Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says this. He said, can two people walk together except they be what? In agreement. While you and I are here in church singing songs, giving offerings, and as a result, he's expecting his blessings. God is saying, what, do I, what did you want to go to that place to go and do again? I went to church to, to bless you. Bless who? He said, I don't know you. You don't even know me. You, you can't even smell my fragrance, not to talk about know me. So there is a disconnect. And this is the heart. This is the heart of the matter. What I titled, what I'm sharing with you today is A Matter of the Heart. That's the title of today's message. A Matter, a Matter of the Heart. The first thing is this. I said before, I said the Old Testament has portrayed God as a biased killer in favor of Israel. But that is not who he is. When God told Israel to come into a land he is going to give them and throw away this the other people. Now that is human language of expression. It is not God that was throwing away the Jebusites. This might shock you. But just so God is fair, a fair judge, fair to everyone, Amalekites, Jebusites, Israelites, the same way, he said, he, he rather allowed his people, Israel, to be slaves in suffering for 400 years, so that every opportunity for mercy and change will be given to what? The Philistines. Some of you know, when he said, because the cup of the Amorites is not Yet fool, what does he mean? He said, I am still giving a chance to these people so that they can repent and say, Meanwhile, let my people suffer and cry, and I won't even hear to them, hear them. That is the God. They do not know me. Do you? Do you have an idea of what you call who you call God? Who you worship. So, let me quickly wrap this thing up. So, God is not a vindictive killer. He is not biased against anyone or for anybody. If God loves everyone he created, I want you to see, know this, whether you are an Amalekite, a Jebusite, or an Israelite, and this thing, he is for you. He is not against you. I don't care how, how wicked you are today or helpless you may be. In fact, do you know the, how this chapter ended? I told you to read the whole chapter later on. But do you know the, how this chapter ended? This nine chapter, nine chapter. Let's read the last two verses to give you an idea. But you are going to read in between that we have jumped. A time is coming, he said, when I will punish those who are circumcised in body but not in spirit. Who do you think he's saying, having in mind in the case? No, no. Circumcised in spirit, I'm, I'm sorry, is in body but not in spirit. Who are those? Circumcised in body, in body, in body, but not in spirit. That takes you to Romans chapter 2. For a Jew is not a Jew who is circumcised outwardly, but is inwardly. Who do you think he's talking about? He said, the time is coming when I'm going to punish All those who are circumcised in body, but not in spirit. Now listen to the last verse. It will shock you. Who are they? Egy now, you can read. So call them out. Number one, Egyptians, Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites, the people who live in the desert, in remote places. We are talking about Nigeria. In fact, including the Niger Delta. Remote places. 
And yes, and yes, and yes. Today, who will those people be? The church. And like all these pagan nations, the people of Israel So what, as far as God is concerned, the problem he has is not an unbeliever problem. The same thing that he has as a problem with the unbelievers is going on where again? In the church. Now here is the dilemma of the prophet who is now looking for a place to go and cry and weep. And lead us. On, see, we can give you titles to bear. But I think leaders know this enough. That your title is useless. Except to you. Because you wanted a title. But if you want in the eyes of God to be seen and called a leader. These things that are happening that are destroyed interpersonal relationship amongst us. Should break your heart. Should drive you to your knees. And you will join the wailing women and cry. Lifting our voices unto God and say, God, please have mercy. Because remember, see, and by the time you finish reading the whole chapter, you see, I, I'm about to do certain things. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. God has been having mercy. Like I said before, God in the Old Testament looked like a girl. It, it, it biased God against Israel, um, towards Israel, against everybody else. But no, in fact, let me give you the scripture and I can't read it again. Leviticus chapter 18. If you read from Leviticus chapter 18, verse 24 to 30, you will see there, back to Old King, uh, New King James, you will see there God explaining. In fact, he is not the one that even drove out the Amalekites and the Jebusites. They are the ones that drove themselves out. You will not understand, but just, just give me verse 26. You read the whole of that place. That's how I give you. Give me verse 26 alone. He is telling Israel, he said, You therefore keep my statutes and my judgment and shall not commit any of these abominable things. From the beginning of the chapter, 18 chapter of Leviticus, it mentions some of these things. And you will be surprised we are now living doing those things today. Women in Lagos now sleep with dogs for money. It's in the chapter. I hear before cow people sell their cows, they sleep with them. And you go and buy them and eat them. You therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these what? I'm not hearing the word. Either any of your, of your na own nation, either, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. And um, next verse, and then we'll cut it. Why? For all these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you. Thus, the land is what? See, what it simply means, this is, this is a teaching throughout the, it, it is consistent throughout the Bible. The acts, the sins of the people defile what you do. Your business, your land. If your business is not this, don't blame it on the church or the pastor doesn't come and pray. It is your lifestyle that defiles everything you touch. Next verse. Lest the land do what? Vomit you out also, also when you defile it as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Now, question. Who are the people, who, what was responsible for the people, the Jebusite ambition being thrown away from that land? God or sins? 
See, if you don't know the Bible, you will read the Bible and say, oh, it was God that threw away these people so that he can bring Israel. No, no, no. The Bible said for God. And if you read the whole chapter, God repeated it about twice or three times. It is the sins that the people commit makes the land do what? <laughs> Listen, gentlemen. The, some of the difficulties we are facing in... See, this was Israel. This was Israel. Notice that Jeremiah was crying against the sins of Israel. But today, in today's world, bring it to our time. Who is today's Israel now? The church. We are the today church. And these things are still happening in our midst. And a, just, a God of justice is not discriminatory towards one people alone. What he does, who he is, is still the same. Now, let's go to verse number, get back to our text, and let's go to chapter... Oh, verse 33, 23 to 26. Thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 9, 23. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his... Uh, go on. But let him who glories glory in this. That he understands and knows me. Underline, 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 underline. Remember, God's complain has been these people do this thing because they do not know me. And God is now giving them the clue on how they can come out, change their situation. It's because they do not know me. They take pride in, look at how successful I am. There are some of our brothers that are doing well in business and they think that is success. Now this is the common problem of Christians and Israelites. The Pharisees consider riches and prosperity a favor, a mark of their holiness. So when you are prosperous, when you have a good job and a good car and your family, your children are in Covenant University. It must be because I'm a righteous man. When you see that brother who cannot feed himself in the church, say this is because of their sins. You understand? You don't say it out, but that is your mindset. That is your thought. Let me tell you something. Some of the best people that God calls can sometimes be very... That's why I gave you the picture of this young man when I called out and said, no house, nothing. Some of the best faithful people can sometimes be that bad. It depends on the call. So what God is saying, let, if, you, if you want to glory, glory only in these things. That's verse 24. That he understands and knows me. God is saying, if any person want to glory, if any person has any reason to rejoice in the church, this is the condition and this is the basis why you rejoice. What is that again? Let's say it again. Can I? Okay, let's finish the verse. That I am the Lord. Exercising three things. Loving kindness, yes. Judgment, and yes, in the earth. Where? In the earth. The next, finish that chapter, verse. Go. We'll stop there. For in these I delight, says the Lord. In what things he delight? God says, these are the things that delight my heart. Now, are you listening, Christian? When God said, this is what delights me, make me smile. And he mentions them. See, God is not trying to hide from us. He's trying to tell us how his heart. He said, you don't know me. And you boast in your intelligent three things. He said, you God. What are those three things? Can you, can you mention those three things? That this thing? Number one. Wisdom. The ability to understand certain things that make you, places you ahead of you are remarkable in having insight into situations and this thing. Anybody with that remarkable ability to read situations and have skill in doing certain things, believe they are better than everybody else. And normally it places them at an advantage over, over several people. And such people are sometimes arrogant and blessed and something. They think 
They are better than everybody. God said, that may be it. Even if you are that, I give it to you, but don't glory on that. Number two thing that men consider success is what again? Might. Those who have might. Special ability to do what every other person cannot do. Number three, riches, of course. Controlling resources to do other things that men, the others can just dream about. You want to buy a car, you want to travel, you want to do something else, others can only dream about it, you can do it. He said, don't glory about that. But if you want to glory, let me give you something to glory about. This, if you have this, then glory in it. What are those things? Number one, love and kindness. Number two, judgment. And then what? What again? Righteousness. Now let me explain in the simplest form these things that delight God's heart. What is love and kindness? The old Hebrew word kesed there means three English words. Mercy, kindness, or goodness. Brothers and sisters in the church. Mercy, say mercy. mercy. Kindness, kindness, love, love. Goodness. goodness. That's what this, in English from this style, we will spell kesed, Hebrew word meaning loving kindness. God's type of love, agape. He said, you don't know me, let me introduce myself to you. This is who I am. If you have this, these are the things that delight me. You can go ahead and boast because you have that. What is love? First and foremost, love in its purest form cannot be described by human words. There is one place where the definition of love can be found. And it's not in the dictionary. It's on the cross. You want to know what love looks like? It means I becoming what you want me to be and die naked, stripped, publicly to bear your shame so that the consequences of sin that should have happened to you will not happen to you. Is there any brother or any sister that is willing to empty your bank account just so that another brother or sister will not be thrown out. That is love. Is there any brother or sister that can do that? God said, you don't know me. And stop calling yourself, I am a child of God. You are a child of Satan. Don't look at me like that. That's what Jesus, I'm quoting Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ spoke to the Jews. He said this. He said, he said you are of your father, the devil. Talking to the Hebrew people in the temple. They wanted to stone him. He had to, he had to hide and run away. Please don't stone me. I'm not going to call you the devil, but, but you are getting the picture. Now, I know what I am saying probably is, can only be spoken by a Pastor James in a church like this. So we cannot run three services. Because you can rarely, if you do, hear sermons like this in any church platform. Ever. Because I can, after being away for some time, I come and tell you, hey, it is time to upload so that we can explode. And then we can have great services and wonderful time and we can go. But listen, gentlemen, did you know that the queen is dead? And she's not taking any of the jewels with her. You and I are next. Every one of us will keep this appointment. And when you stand there, as she is standing there, they are not going to call you queen. See, you don't know God. Before him, we are just equal. Nobody is worshipping anybody anywhere. And the people you will see in exalted positions in heaven 
will shock you. In fact, if there's anything like heart attack, you will have heart attack in heaven. <laughs> Trust me. Go, all you need to do, go, go back to the Bible. That rich man in Luke 16 or 17 like that, when he looked at Abraham's bosom, guess who? Now Abraham's bosom is a name, a metaphor used to describe a privileged position in heaven. Who was the person that was there? Lazarus. This guy that used to sit at my gate. Okay, Abraham, can you, this is what he is good at doing. Send him a message. Let him go and fetch water. Because, see, because guys still think this is earth. No, this is not, this is not earth. This is heaven. In his presence, you are somebody. But that is if you lived like him. So what I am saying, I'm not trying to put you down. What I am saying, I came to prepare you for that day. Because old or young, every one of us is intelligent enough to, enough to know one day we will stand before him. Coming to the church. Today, our churches are filled with what I call churchians, not Christians. Churchians are familiar with everything church. We know the songs. We know the tradition. We know when to stand. We know what to dance. We know what to shut up. We know when to act as if we are listening, but we are asleep. We know everything about what to do in the church. But just mistakenly step, even if, even if I'm sleeping, just step on my toes or kick my leg when you are passing. You will see the viper that will come out of me. That is the viper I'm trying to address. Crooked people are in our midst. The snake, the nature of the Satan that is in us that make us cheat to defraud, to kill, to do these things. And God says, I can't take it anymore. Jeremiah said, let me go somewhere out of my people and go and cry and all these things. is alive inside of us. We are in the church. We're familiar with all the processes, but not a drop of the nature of God. And God, in three languages that he said, he said, this is who I am like. Number one, I am what? A God that like to, he used this word, exercises. What is the word exercising? That means this is what I do. Exercising, what again? The first thing is what? I like to sacrifice myself for the betterment of other people. At my expense, I promote you, my sister. What can I do for you? Now, in a Nigerian parlance, that looks like stupidity. Give me some Nigerian parlance. Oh, 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 there. Mm -hmm. Come on. You know them. You are one of them. So, come on. <laughs> sorry, 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 but. Mungu. Come on. You are speaking the perfect language. You are used to it. This shame every one of us. That a Christian cannot love. Loving and show mercy. What is mercy? Releasing a person that is in your power for you to hurt. Because the person did something wrong to you. And you could crush the person. You have the ability to. Your enemy. Somebody who deserves it. But you let go. That's mercy. Now, point to me. Seven, I mean, two people in the church you know are an example of that characteristic. Including the man speaking. And if that doesn't make us weep, let's look at the second characteristic God said he is. He said, these are the things I exercise. If we know these things, he said, be happy. Love and kindness, what's the second one he said again? Remind me. Judgment. Or in today's English, not judgment, 
Justice. What does that mean, justice? It means doing what is right and proper. Doing what is right and proper. This is, in this simplest form, this is all I'm going to do. How do I know when a person has that characteristics? It shows up in your reaction when you are wronged. When somebody takes advantage of you, when somebody insults you, when something unfair is done to you, how do you, that's, I want to hear your word, how do you, your reaction after today's service, when you go home, when you leave this place, how do you react? Now listen to me. I'm not saying, I'm not saying the person did not do wrong. I'm saying you have been wronged. Person has taken advantage of you. That person deserves to be slapped in the Nigerian sense of the word. But because you are not a Nigerian, you are a Christian, not a churchian. Justice or judgment means to do what is right. I'm just giving you the overhead. Because justice, according to God, so Abraham called God, described God as the judge of the whole earth. Okay? And justice actually have two parts. How many parts? No, come on. You have done so well. Stay with me. Justice have how many parts? Two parts. What is the first part of justice? To do, do what is right, what is fair. It is like this. If, when, if and when a time comes, you are caught doing something wrong and you are guilty, you know you are guilty. What do you expect from the person? that you have wronged? Punishment or pardon? What is it? What do you want, the pers- what do you want from the person? Pardon. Huh? Pardon. I'm not hearing. Pardon. pardon. So as you w- wish others to do unto you, so do unto them. So from this day, do not take vengeance. As an act. That's what a child of God does. He said, God, God is saying, you don't know me. This is who I am. These are the things that delight me. When I see a child. Now listen to me. One act of kindness may open a door for you more quicker than a night vigil. Look at me very well and hear my language. The reason why we are praying and praying and praying and things are not opening, happening. Prayers should change the life of those who pray. But why are you still like that? Nothing to show for it. Because God is not after your prayers. He is after the heart of the person praying. When your tongue is like a snake and you are praying, you are wasting your time. Because First Samuel 16, God does not see as a man sees. A man sees, looks at the outside, what you do as a churchian practice and activities. God says, no, those are not the things I look at. What I look at, when I look at a person, I look at a person from where? From the inside. That's why I call it a matter of the heart. Knowing God begins where? Here. Not the songs you sing, not the sing, none of that. And t- to tell you the truth, as your pastor, I'll tell, I am tired of all of this nonsense. Justice, doing right thing has two parts. Number one, yes, we want kindness, pardon to be shown to us, doing the right thing. Never forget, whenever you talk about justice, never forget the word react. Say that word again, react. Say it again. Because justice always shows up in your reaction to when something wrong has been done to you. Because, listen to me, when as a, as a human being, before I come to talk about Christian, as a human being, as a Christian, when somebody or something wrong happens to me, I complete the sentence. I, but as a Christian, my reaction should be not in nature, in the form of a human being, my reaction should be in the nature of how my father reacts. Are you understanding me? But when, because I make mistake, cursings and hurtful and negative words come out of your mouth, that is the snake speaking, not your heavenly father. 
Because a leader, because the pastor did in the past, like I said, we've all messed it up, but today we've received mercy from God. Today, behold, is the beginning of a new day. So justice has two sides, doing what is right and pardon on the other side. This side of the coin of the justice, you may not like it. But if, even if your name is David and you killed somebody to take the person's wife, God will say to you, my justice will not allow you to escape with that sin. The sword shall not depart from your house. Yeah? You understand what it is? That's justice. But when it comes to us, he said, don't take vengeance on yourself. Leave that side for me. I will know when to exercise mercy and pardon for that person. And if I've given the person enough of time, the cup is full, I will know when to exact that. Meanwhile, on your side, you pour water. Give water to the person that is hurting you. Because by doing that, you are pouring cold water on the person, coals of fire on the person's head. Leave vengeance for me. I will take care of it. You continue to do what is right, what is necessary. That is justice. Now, God said, these are the things that delight me. Number one, love and kindness. Number two, justice. What is the third one again? Well, that one I will give you one word. What is righteousness? Just right. Just doing what is right. Tell me one example of a person that who is always right. Give me an example. Someone who is always right. David, Paul, Moses, who? Huh? Come on, come on, Christians, give me one example. Who else? Jesus Christ said this when a rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, good master. Jesus Christ said, why are you calling me good? Only two people are good. Is that what he said? Only who? Who is that? Righteousness is being and having the nature of God. Being right at all the time. And God is saying, you want to delight my heart? You want to make me glad as a child, as my, to, be, to be my child, to be like me? These are the things that delight me. Not lies, defrauding, and cheating, and no, no, no. The things that delight me. Let's, let's, let's call them again, number one again. Eleven kindness, number two. Number three. One more time again, number one. Which I said, loving kindness, which I said is sometimes also defined as mercy, kindness, love, goodness. Okay? It is in one word, agape, having the love of God, having that in your heart. And it only comes to the heart of a person that has born again. It starts when you accept Jesus Christ, agape comes into your heart. From that moment allow, the Bible said the, the love of God is shed abroad in us. If you are born again, don't tell me, I, me, I'm not like that to my nature. Your nature is either God or Satan. Don't give me that crap. I say, in my family, we are always like that. Oh, your family is the family of the devil. Or you belong to the family of God. It's one way or, or the other. We all come from hot heads, families of hot heads. But when Christ comes into you, he changes your nature. That will be the subject of my second part on this message. But the first part is God introducing himself. He's saying clearly the things he doesn't like. And I am telling you, we've had enough. There has to be a separation in the house of God. Either you're a child of God or you are a, ch a child of Satan. Those of us who are called to lead must now stand in the place of Jeremiah and cry and weep in prayer 
for God's mercy not only to abound, but for him. Now remember what he said. He said, I will melt them. Please read this whole chapter. I will melt them down as a crucible, in the crucible, and test them and squeeze them. God is saying, I'm going to, uh, one of the verses that we read, I, 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 I think you still remember that. I will melt them down like a metal or something like that, he was saying. Okay? Now, remember, you and I, we are God's hand, God's representatives. Our eyes should be open. Leaders should be able to rebuke, correct like Jeremiah, and confront them. No more covering up of anybody. When you not next time see a sister opening her tongue, her mouth, and a serpent is coming down, rebuke that child of God. Right there and then. And when that correction is done once or twice in love, in love, but will not change, then please let me know because I will call the elders and tell the elders. So there are some of you I have already now. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't have said this, but I'm going to say it. There are some of you I have already listed on the list waiting to be expelled. I'm going to tell the elders, I said, this person cannot be in the church again. Your time is up. Because every, most of the time, every disagreement between a brother and a brother that we can trace to, we can trace it back to you. In the book of Proverbs, this is going to take me, let me in the book of Proverbs, there are seven things that are an abomination unto God. One of them is he that divides, separates friends. For how long will we hold back mercy and forgiveness and you will not change? You will not respect elders when you are talking to them and trash come out of your mouth? You will not respect your wife. You will not respect your husband. You don't respect church leaders. Because we give you a name and a title, you think you are the Alpha and the Omega. We will not see traces of loving kindness and pardon. We all make mistakes. And pastors, we are the worst. But I dare you, any one of you who is under the sound of my voice, to confront this man that whose voice you are hearing. Of any hurt I have done to you, any in whatever it is. And if you hear anything other than I am sorry, or anything other than that, but to make excuse to say eh, it's because you talk like that, that's why I give unto you. Who do you think I am? Then this man whose voice you are hearing is not a child of God. The children of God, we are products of mercy. I don't know who you, I don't know, I don't know about you, but we are here because of God's mercies. And one thing with mercy is this. Mercy is not to be given and consumed. Anyone that receives or becomes a recipient of mercy is only on one condition, that you give it. Keep it flowing. Mercy is never banked. Keep it going. The day you stop having mercy, God says, I stop giving you, showing you mercy. Love and kindness. What was the second one again? Justice. Commit to doing the right thing at all times. Now, this is not only to people who do the right thing to you, even mostly to people who are not worthy of your love or of your pardon. And thirdly, commit to righteousness. He said, these are the things that delight me. When I see a person like this, it is not night vigil you need. He said, ask me what you want. I'll do it for you. Because whenever I see you, you bring a smile to my face because this is who you are. To your husband, to your wife, to your fellow church member, you do these things, you bring a smile to my eyes. No power of witch or sorcery can change your situation. When God delights in you, he makes even your enemies to be at peace. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why your long prayers and your vigils and fasting is not changing anything in your family. Change your heart. Not the songs and the 
things we are doing on the external. Ladies and gentlemen, the heart of the matter today, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. A matter of the heart. Hearts that have not been transformed. Hearts that have not smelt God's salvation. Enough is enough. Let God help us going forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father. <laughs>